And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple. Part of the Hypercosmos team and developers of the Mythic Revolutions TTRPG. The one and only Yota. How are you doing today? Well, t well this hey. afternoon for you, this morning for me. Yeah, it's afternoon. Hey, nice to meet you. Your blessings. Mm -hmm. And yeah, really happy to be here. Thank, thank you for coming in. So... I suppose the first place to start is it is the humble beginnings, in a sense. So with that in mind, I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. I think for me it was um, uh, the creation part, like creating worlds, creating characters. Uh, it was in my teenage years, like 14, 15 years old, and I remember, like, completely, I was with a friend of mine, and she was really angry because her boyfriend was playing this weird game, D&D, &D. <laughs> and she was like, oh, let, let's find something to do to hang out, and I'm like, what do you mean? They are pretending to be warriors and elves? I, I want to do that! <laughs> so, yeah, that was the beginning. Mm-hmm. And did you did you largely stick with that with that one system, or did you do a, do a lot of rules hopping over the years afterwards? No, no, no I did a lot of rules hopping, and now I've uh, let D and D behind like almost completely. Like uh, when I moved into the big city, Athens, mm -hmm. I played D and D for a very little, like. Uh, less than a year and then i got introduced into faith and that was awesome mm -hmm. it, i love uh, systems that give you a lot of freedom so yeah i stick to faith and savage worlds a lot mm -hmm. and uh, uh then we moved on to world of darkness that was a beautiful experience so awesome mm -hmm. and uh, now my current obsession is uh, call of cthulhu oh just remember, Mage is a perfectly balanced game with no visible exploits. <laughs> well, I'm a, a huge fan of Mage, uh, but yeah, we have to do a lot of tweaks, so I'll accept that. Yeah. Yeah, I like Mage too, but I can't. But I can't deny that it is com that it is um, borked. Yeah, we have to ignore a lot of things. It's like uh, the Marvel Cinematic Universe. We have to ignore a lot of things for all of it to work and be canon. <laughs> oh. And I do... I have... Yeah, there's a lot There's a lot of stuff that has to be glossed aside, especially... Especially the stock character sheets. Beca because... That one, those one-page character sheets can do can do fine early on, but you get a little ways into a campaign, and that is not enough space for what you need. Yeah, 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 totally. We always had the little folder, <laughs> oh. and also the numbers themselves. Sometimes, like we had to ignore the stats <laughs> sometimes, or like I don't know, make the scale a bit more uh, representative. Mm -hmm. Um, like mo, I think for the, for the longest time, people people were using the custom sheets that Mister Gone was making, to the point where Onyx Path decided to just cut out the middleman and hire him directly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like the fans need you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like if you can't if you can't beat them, join them. Yeah. But with the, with that in with that in mind. When it came to the when it came to the idea of doing your own system with Mythic Revolutions, how did that come about? 
uh, that is actually a very very long process that began before uh, okay not before I was born by one of my colleagues for this but yeah around that time uh, the main creator of uh, the world of mythic revolution uh, Fotis Sagonas um, always had this idea of creating a system that will uh, realistically represent um, battle, um, like everyday problems, uh, etc. And also combine it with a heavy supernatural element. So yeah, it began when he was a teenager. I mean, he's, uh, he's old now. <laughs> and uh, then he lured us in when we were also young and innocent. And um, always we had this in mind, like create something uh, realistic in terms of uh, battle or uh, any fatigue, like psychological fatigue and pain and uh, literal, and um, combine it with a heavy supernatural and um, otherworldly uh, themes that we want and plane shifting, etc. So we used a lot of uh, elements from um, other cultures and religion and myths. So I have, I hope I was um, coherent enough. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. Now, when it comes to the core mechanic, the core mechanic, what's known as the Hypercosmos D6 system. I will admit see, seeing this D6 base pool with a special with a with um red and white die the way it's ha the way it's handled. The first thing that comes to mind is the is the D is the D6 system that was pioneered by West End Games through th through things like through things like um Ghostbusters International the Star the Star Wars D6 um. And event and eventually the D6 trilogy of of D6 fantasy adventure in space. Um, was that one of the major influences? And if not, what were what were some existing systems that served as influence to go into this D, go into the setup that the Hypercosmos system has? Well, it was uh, in uh, equal terms uh, a bit of Star Wars. The Star Wars D6 system we like a lot, and we also we don't like it much. Like uh, it doesn't um, uh, agree with our uh, system thought, like as a whole the game. Mm -hmm. Although we like a lot some things uh, from the battleships, etc., because we want to do also some sci-fi sci stuff. Mm -hmm. But anyway, yeah, this D6 D6 system was a thought but at the same time because the thought was like to to have a game that's gonna be uh, both realistic both like uh, serious like heavy in the themes but at the same time uh, something that will be easy to play easy to play by anyone uh, so the d6 is very famous in greece because we play a lot of backgammon there are there are a ton of uh, six-sided dice everywhere because people play a lot of backgammon. Mm -hmm. Like, I, are you familiar with this uh, image of old men playing around, uh, sometimes in parks or in coffee shops? Yes. And throwing dice yes. and shouting. Yeah, it's very Balkan. <laughs> yeah, I'm ve I'm very familiar, and it's not it's. Sometimes, sometimes, sometimes it's backgammon. Sometimes it's chess. Sometimes it's dominoes. But yeah, old, yeah. But old men, old men playing a playing a game and arguing with each other. That is that is nothing. That is nothing new. Oh. Yeah, exactly. I've I've seen I've seen Monopoly start start arguments. I've seen um I've seen people sweat over playing Jenga, and I've I've jokingly said that Jenga should be considered a form of torture. Uh, I agree completely. <laughs> and whenever I say that, people are like it's, it it's not that it's not that painful. 
Say that say that again late game where where everybody thinks a stiff breeze will knock the tower over. <laughs> yeah, it, it destroys relationships for sure. Oh. These di these days there's always certain games that are that are likely to start fights and whenever I see someone say that a that a given board or board game or, or RPG is too complicated I always point them to the campaign for North Africa board game. Campaign for uh, North Africa? Yeah, where the bo where the board is larger than a small child. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Sometimes, yeah, people take that approach, like bigger, better, more, th more stuff, a bigger box. There, there was a lot. There was a lot of that. Um, more detail is better attitude in the 70s. And the campaign for North Africa is one of the more infamous cases since it is a what's what was known as a monster board game. <laughs> and there's Yeah, yeah. Well... There's an infamous image where so, where somebody um somebody t somebody had take had opened up the board and had, and had their kid lay, lay next to it for a size comparison. And... Yeah, but I mean... Oh, sorry. No, oh, yeah, I mean, it seems like that everyone in the 70s had a huge table going around, or uh, people would uh, make space on the carpet to spread everything. Yeah, um, that image that I just sent to you. <laughs> Okay, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. When you said bigger than a small child, I thought, I thought like a little bigger. This is like an adult. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think I think the full board is like is like nine feet long or um. And it, what about the tokens of this game? Like, what about the other assets? Um. About this, uh, about sta about standard size, it's all it's all hexes. Um, so it's it's about two point seven meters long. Okay, yeah. Because imagine something like that for terraforming Mars. It should come in a container with all the tokens and stuff, etc. Sad thing is, I don't have to imagine that because I'm pretty sure someone's already done it. Uh, I don't think it's already done, but uh, someone should uh, combine all the the extras and and soon, mm -hmm. because like uh, the the house will be full of boxes if you want to play the whole of it. Well, that now that being that being said. Oh, when it comes, one of the things I do f I do find a bit interesting looking at the looking at the hero sh looking at the hero sheets that you ha that you have is that you have you have it built on oh, templates, and is that is that something that's going to be present in the f in the full game where there, where there's going to be a set of Example templates the way there were example templates in like D six. Templates, you mean like um, character archetypes? Yeah, the in the... the in the um, sample adventure, there's the, there's that set of heroes templates. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, there, there's gonna be these uh, hero templates, the, the archetypes as we call them, mm -hmm. uh, because they they work best with the with the adventure. Now, with the with that in mind, it, it's it's looking like for th for things like HP and fatigue, it's more about these symbols that'd be crossed out rather than a rather than a number. Yeah, yeah, so... it's it's more like uh, that's what you have to spend. Mm -hmm. So one of the, so one of the key thing key things that I'd ask is. In re is when it comes to the core, when it comes to the core mechanic, 
is it a case where you are where where you are rolling to and comparing to a um to a set to a set target number or is it a case where you're trying to roll a certain number of die over over a th over a threshold like a success based approach uh you have uh, a set number uh the number 10 mm -hmm. for all for everything not almost everything the only uh, it changes only when you are against someone or uh, something <laughs> mm -hmm. and you have to roll to pass their uh, defense uh, otherwise it's always a 10 like the sum of 10 and uh, when you make 10 like or of course 12 like if you have two sixes it's 12 because it's a six-sided die mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and when you are you have this sum and uh, you are okay you set it aside then you you stop thinking of uh, adding the numbers and you count the rest of the dice that are on the table mm -hmm. these are the um, the critical successes let's say yeah so no ma so no matter what the there's a there's a there's a rule of 10 in order to succeed and based on based yeah. on that would it be fair that the that difficulty is instead represented by how many red die are added to a roll. Yeah, yeah, yeah. St instead of chase, ch changing the, th the threshold all the time, uh, the GM just gives you a red die. Mm -hmm. Which, if I'm reading this, if I'm reading this right, a red die can is a die t is a um, die type that that either subtracts or cancels out a die of the same of the same type. Yeah, the same uh, exactly. facing, I should say. Yeah, and uh, we are uh, very frugal uh, when we give red dice, as we have a small number of uh, white dice, mm -hmm. because uh, the explosive system it's very exciting. It can be overpowered very easily, just as well. Uh, the red dice can be a problem very easily, so we try to keep it balanced like that. Mm -hmm. Now, with with that with that said, when I look at when I look at the templates, I I see that it is that there's not much there's nothing in the way of the traditional attribute and skill dichotomy. It is doubling down on attributes, not on attributes on um, skills. Um, there, but there's there's. There's a few things within the within the entry that I was curious about. The um, numerals that are that are on it. That's obviously the skill level. Um, mm -hmm. That diamond that has RD is that is that just to represent that someone's trained in the skill, and if if they're not, then they then it generates a red die. If they are not like if uh, the diamond is white, like it has no black dot. Mm -hmm. Uh, or which is you know a dot that you blacken, uh, it means yeah that you do not have it, so it uh, instantly then generates a red die because you are trying to do something that you have no idea mm -hmm. how. But yeah, you have a shot anyway. Yeah, and there's there's after the um, skill levels, there's four circles after that. Is that meant to represent experience or or like the pip modifiers in? D six. Yeah, it may it's meant to represent uh, experience. Mm -hmm. Like uh, the more you circle, like if you circle the first uh, level, you can uh, you have a reroll. Uh, you can always if you have the first level, you can reroll your um, uh, your one or your two. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Sadly, you keep what you rerolled. <laughs> I say sadly because yeah, I, I like uh, the rules to be easy on me, and uh, I don't like that. It's it goes hard on me because I I don't have a good hand. But okay, yeah. This this system is uh, supposed to be, um, uh, let's say, uh, not difficult because it's very easy to play, but you are in danger, and you have to understand it. Um, because when you when you when you said experience, what 
for whatever reason, the mindset that I had is if you fill it in, fill it in um, four times, it resets and your skill level goes up by one. Is it a case like that or no? Uh, sorry, what did you mean? If I fill it up? If um, if those if those circles are filled, if all four of those circles are filled up, then your sk your skill level goes up by one, and those circles reset. Ah, uh, no, no. Uh, so, uh, uh, as we described, so it's the the first uh, sp space that you blacken with a dot mm -hmm. is that you have the skill, okay? At mm -hmm. um, at a basic level. Uh, when you circle a line, like you circle it with your hand, it means that you have the first uh, the first level. Like don't, not you do not blacken the small circles. Mm -hmm. You circle the line to know that okay, I have the first level. This gives you a reroll. If you circle the two lines, like level two, you have an extra die, mm -hmm. etc. With the rest of the lines. Yep. So the little circles now is for you to remember. Um, the extras, mm -hmm. because you may have an extra reroll from something else, from like, uh, let's say, a divine power that gave you something, mm -hmm. or something that is not, uh, that's not forever. All right. That's why you blacken, if you blacken one circle, it means uh, you have one reroll. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, you can combine it if you have the skill at the first level, you can combine your reroll with the other, with the temporary or um, from something else. Because in the future, spoiler, but uh, except from the skills, you'll also have uh, talents. Mm -hmm. And the talents give you very nice things. So yeah, you keep track uh, of it with this. And you can combine two rerolls to make an extra die. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes... Now there's a there's a couple other th a couple other things I was I was curious about. Um, one of them is the concept of divine grace that's on the sheet. Uh, what does that, what does that entail? Well, that is um, it's like when you are uh, uh, the chosen the chosen of a god. Mm -hmm. Uh, but because we started playing um, uh, in very historical context, and that's how we continue, we are heavily on the historical side, and the revolutions is our favorite uh, time space. Uh, so we're talking uh, realistic. We're talking about people that um, believe in mostly the same gods. Like they they are uh, separated in big portions of uh, Christianity, um, in general Abrahamic religions, um, some um, uh, Native American religions, um, etc., uh, and some uh, you know all the Greek uh, twelve gods uh, just you know for the salt and pepper, mm -hmm. and okay. so. Um, Everyone, it's like D and D. I mean, they exist. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. you can call on them, and they're gonna be more um, uh, positive to you if you are a, a person that believes and prays a lot, etc. But uh, everyone has a chance at divine grace because this is the whole idea of the heavy supernatural uh, effect uh, in the game. That there are uh, big powers that if you align yourself with big ideas and, um, and ideas that bring light in the world and goodness, they're going to hear you. Like, you may approach them from uh, the, the religions I, I talked about because we are talking in a historical context. But uh, regardless, you may approach them and uh, they may answer. So, Divine Grace uh, can save you in very, very hard situations. Much like a Quintessence in uh, WOD. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, sp I suppose... I've often talked about how a lot of games have what I've, re what I've referred to as an extra effort uh, mechanic. I know some people use the term meta-currency, but that doesn't... But that doesn't in evoke anything, so... 
or rather it's too it's too broad so i don't use that term um yeah but yeah and also like uh the point is to have mechanics that uh, uh reflect the game mm -hmm. but like for ex for example world of darkness has willpower um shadowrun has edge that ki that kind of thing is present in a lot of in a lot of games i'd say the fate points in well fate also are applicable yeah yeah and i can i can see divine grace being th being that um the it, other... it can be used it mostly used like that yeah 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 the other one is reality synchronicity ah <laughs> yeah so um Divine Grace is exactly, uh, it, it can be used exactly like you described. But now, Reality Synchronicity was born uh, because of the context of the revolutions and the big historical events that we want to talk about. Uh, because Reality Synchronicity, it's much, much more difficult to, uh, to attain. Like, you have to do something very important or be in some very present in some very important historical events or decisions and uh, you have to want to influence them like for real and try for that mm -hmm. so it's uh you're gonna take like uh maybe one in each adventure or if it's a big adventure more but uh yeah because with the reality synchronicity points you can do exactly that. You can change reality. Mm -hmm. You can reimagine uh, history uh, a bit like uh, Quentin Tarantino did in *Inglorious Bastards*. Mm -hmm. And it it def I, in that same vein of extra effort, I have referred to s similar mechanics as a um, edit button. Um. And it sounds like that's the case here. Now, I know that character creation wasn't delved into in the um, da in the Dangerous Games um, preview. Yeah. But do you have do you have it planned that it's full it's full free form full point based or is it a case where you're taking one of the archetypes and add and adding a few points to it? Um. Um, a bit of both. Like it's mostly like um, skills, attributes, and points. And uh, it. Uh, but for now, we're gonna use the archetypes to guide the players, mm -hmm. to make them a bit more, a bit more acquainted with the system. Mm -hmm. uh, but the general uh, thought is to um, have an intro that guides you uh, how you wanna play. And it, it kind of leads you to an archetype. Not you do not uh, like pick an archetype and build on it. It uh, it, it has some questions uh, like how did you grow up? What do you want to do? Uh, pick some of these, and it slowly leads you to the archetype. Mm -hmm. Now, with that in with that in mind, when it in within the within the dangerous games um but within the dangerous games preview that's uh, that's on the kickstarter um there's a there's a bit of a talk of a kind of a kind of victory point setup is that something that's going to take of to make other appearances and take other forms in the full book uh, not really, because Dangerous Games is, is like a, an easy uh, game uh, that you can play it in half an hour rounds mm -hmm. uh, just to, to gather victory points and be happy <laughs> that you won. Uh, like instead of playing um, a card game, you can play this like and enjoy the system and uh, participate in a run, mm -hmm. let's say. Uh, and this is actually in a historical context because uh, in uh, during the Greek Revolution, that's what the warriors would do when they were waiting, in between battles. Mm -hmm. They would uh, just to to remain, you know, active. They would race each other and they would um, uh, 
uh, they would be against the Greek uh, land that uh, that could be very hard at times, like mountains, rocks. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, that, that's the idea. The the whole victory point uh, gathering it's not going to be present in the beginning. And now, with with that in with that in mind, even the tricky th the tricky thing about doing games set game set in points of history is how is wiggle room, like how how much wiggle room of be of being as close to history as possible is th is there for a get or for the given players and GM. Uh, I'm guess. Given the given that theme of taking place during historical revolutions that you have, is it going is it going to be a case where there where um there are going to be some story seeds that you that are present that you could theoretically use to build a campaign around? Yeah, yeah, that's the whole thought of it. Uh, it's it's part of the bigger picture that we want to. Um connect the experiences mm -hmm. uh, as we connect the worlds because we do a lot of uh, time and plane shifting in the game and uh, let's say point of view shifting and that's what we want to do in the whole of uh, the immersive experience of our team let's say that's why we picked the name hypercosmos because uh, they're gonna be we, we love history, that's what started this whole idea, but we also love uh, sci-fi and um, uh, during the creation of the game, like the, our main creator, who is also a writer, wrote a novel that uh, it's still not translated in English, but we hope we do it in the future, that talks about this exactly, uh, a hero that transcends time and lives different things, like and is in... Uh, uh, mythological situations, sci-fi situations, uh, in the future, in the past. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's exactly our idea to connect uh, all of our games. Mm -hmm. And with that, in with that, in with that in mind, uh, unless you have you. Um, You have it written. You have it titled as the beginning. So it's. It sounds like you do have long term, pl long term plans to, fur to further expand. When it comes to when it comes to it, and I I know that the, I know that it's stated that this is a game that's been around for a few years, over in over in Greece. So I'm assuming that there's a ha that there's a handful of um supplemental material that's already there, just not, just ha just not translated yet. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's the case. Uh, some of it is actually translated, uh, but um, we we had uh, done a few tweaks uh, over the years because uh, the first book it's completely in Greek. Mm -hmm. uh, the second book was actually both in Greek and in English because it was changed a bit and um, given to the Greeks of Australia. Mm -hmm. And but uh, those systems were not exactly the same with the the current. Uh, they had much more historical elements, and the supernatural elements were more um, Europe based, let's say, and uh, Native Australian for the Greek Australian game. Mm -hmm. uh, we always wanted it to be more. Uh, on the supernatural side, like to have uh, big powers, like low low fantasy world, but with all the big powers that um, humanity has talked about since the since, since the ancient times to be present and can be actually called upon. And we also wanted to uh, talk a lot about the the dream world of uh, Native Americans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that ma that makes sense. Now, with that with that in mind, what would you, 
As far as a total page count for the beginning, what are you shoot? What are you shooting for? Uh, a total page count. Yeah. Said? Oh yeah, a uh, hundred pages. Hundred pa hundred pages. Yeah. I could I could see that this 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 doesn't seem to be a system that would de that would demand a a very large um, affair. Plus, um, releasing it alongside the Zine Quest initiative can kind of hints towards that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, definitely the the system the, does not need a lot of pages. Mm -hmm. uh, we've we've tried it like in uh, in uh, diverse audiences, and uh, we saw that okay, yeah, we can do it uh, minimalistically. Mm -hmm. And what would you be shooting for as far as a release window? Not a date per se, but a broader a broader area. Uh, release window like in uh, in shops um uh, well i'll start with, uh, i'll start within uh, it, at the very least in digital since getting stuff printed is its own particular pain yeah yeah yeah, yeah exactly because <laughs> we're not thinking a lot about that now but it's gonna um, uh until the summer like for sure we're gonna we want to first uh, finish with our kickstarter campaign it's going to end around, it's going to end at 13 March. And uh, then we're going to think about um, the printed versions mm -hmm. and whether it's going to be like we're going to leave the idea of uh, marketing the PDF and uh, go directly to the printed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can, I can certainly get that. And I, and I will be looking forward to seeing how it develops, but with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. Uh, thank you for the wonderful conversation. Mm -hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Okay, cheers then to our health. <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay... Fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>